I was going into my seventh season as a coach, and I was getting a lot of offers after I turned around Louisville's program. However, I didn't feel like it was time to leave the Cardinals yet, as sophomore quarterback Bobby Babcock was back from injury after he broke his vertebrae last year. And since he was undefeated as a starter, the sky was the limit for how good this team could be. Each season, I felt like I became a better head coach, and if we got a couple of lucky results, we had the talent to go all the way. So I was ready to get into our first game of the season against number 18 Miami, Ohio. Since Curtis Bruner, Tyler Starks, TJ Keith, and Greg Smith all graduated, the offense was full of new starters and I thought Bobby Babcock was about to start the game with a huge play until he fumbled the ball away to the Red Hawks. Even though that turnover really hurt in the moment, it wouldn't end up causing us to lose today as the option offense was still working better than ever with Mike Samuel taking it in. The last second pitches from Bobby Babcock to whatever running back was out there were gold and additionally, sophomore star wideout Josh Wilson was still dominating opposing cornerbacks. So I could tell this was going to be a solid year as we beat a ranked team in our opener. Coaching in the biggest rivalry game in Kentucky was always a good time, especially because we were the favorites to win the Governor's Cup. Kentucky hadn't beaten me in years, and I was surprised the Wildcats hadn't offered me a job yet since I grew up a Kentucky fan. This game wasn't even close, and although my offense played well, I have to give credit to my defense. Because because they held the Wildcats to just 14 points in the rain. We started off great at Georgia Tech with senior kicker Isaac Cook nailing a 60-yarder, but my defense didn't show up, so it's a good thing that offensively things were running smoothly as freshman Jordan Brown scored his first collegiate touchdown. By the third quarter, though, it was tied, and Georgia Tech continued to dot up all of my defensive schemes. So you can imagine how excited I was when Bobby Babcock and Mike Samuel ran the read option to perfection to get us a huge 35-yard gain, which set us up to make it 24-24. to And after we stopped the Yellow Jackets inches short on third down, we had the ball in a lot of time that we needed to kill. But then, Bobby Babcock pitched it a second too late, which resulted in a turnover, and partial man-to-man -man coverage was not the move, as quarterback Eugene Grant took advantage of that. Fortunately, this Bobby Babcock run would tie it up, and that would send the game to overtime, where defensively, All-American free safety Wesley Lund laid the hammer, forcing a huge fumble, and even though senior Manuel Daniels couldn't take it back for six, Isaac Cook would seal the game for us in one of my wildest coaching wins yet. But three of our next four games were top 25 matchups, so this could be a long few weeks, and I had to figure out how to get this team past number 10, Miami. We could have had an amazing start to the game, but we didn't, because Bobby Babcock didn't have a strong enough arm to make this throw. However, Wesley Lumpkin continued to prove why he was an All-American defender as he got an interception right back for us. That didn't help though as we were stuck on the goal line and our poor punter got blasted for the safety. I could tell from the start that this game was going to be a defensive battle and for every yard we wanted to gain we had to fight extremely hard. So I decided we were going to control the clock like we did last year. And unfortunately since it was fourth down we only ended the half with three. Like I said this game was a defensive brawl so with with four minutes left, it was still 3-2. to two. And since this would have been a 67-yard field goal, we had to punt, but that didn't matter because cornerback Daniel Hamilton read the Miami quarterback like a book, and our defense would seal the win for the second week in a row. I couldn't believe this final score, but that win moved us into the top 10, and after a bye week, I was coaching against undefeated number 6 Clemson. This one was shaping up to be another defensive stalemate like the Miami game, so it's a good thing that Isaac Cook could kick like Harry Kane. We continued to get massive third down stops, but after giving up six points and struggling to score, we went into the half tied with Clemson. It was obvious that the running game wasn't working well, and so after the Tigers went up by a touchdown at the end of the third quarter, I had to start working in more passing plays, and future starter at tight end freshman Stephen Love took advantage of that. He hauled in his first ever collegiate touchdown, and then Wesley Lumpkin forced a huge third down stop, which led to us setting up to pull off another tight win. Senior Isaac Cook got it done for us again, making him the first kicker I've ever seen when player of the game, and as the number six team in the country, we continued to play at a high level. So I felt bad for any Boston College fans that made the trip to Louisville because this one wasn't close. My offense put up 42 points on the Eagles defense, and it was due to a massive game from Mike Samuel. The next week, I was coaching with a spot in the ACC championship on the line, 
line, and even though we were playing number 9 Florida State, whose only loss was Ohio State, Mike Samuel wasn't intimidated. He was on last year's team, which upset the Seminoles, and he wanted to contribute to that this time. But that wouldn't be easy, because offensively, we couldn't get into the end zone, and Isaac Cook shanked a gimme. Florida State was making my offense look like I was, but then we finally got some life as Bobby Babcock took off and picked up this third and 22. That play would lead to Mike Samuel tying it up before the half with this run, and I'd love to say we kept scoring, but we didn't. Our defense kept us in it through the third quarter, but to win this game, somebody would need to step up soon. And on third and seven, it was Josh Wilson who made the touchdown snag. We could have ended the game here if Daniel Hamilton just held on to this, but instead, it was decided when the Seminoles kicker mimicked Blair Wall and we somehow improved to 7-0. I couldn't believe I was the coach of a top 5 team because we had barely survived so many games, but in the end, all wins count the same, so despite our horrendous start, where we trailed the orange by 17, I wasn't worried. In fact, I was more concerned about if my underdog pick'em was gonna hit. And if you wanna join me and play around with some free cash on underdog placing player pick'ems like the one I showed here, you can sign up to underdog using code Bordeaux or the first link in my description, and it'll double your initial deposit so if you put in like 10 bucks, you'll get 20 in return. You put in 25, you get 50. And that just gives you more to mess around with and have a good time. Anyways, I should probably focus on coaching my team. And even though my offense was no longer working as well as it used to, Bobby Babcock and Josh Wilson were still able to make things happen, getting us within three. And then after holding Syracuse to a field goal, all we needed was a touchdown, but that didn't come easy as my option offense clearly wasn't getting the job done anymore. On fourth down, the Syracuse cornerback made a miraculous play and after that the game was in the hands of the defense. We could have gotten a stop too but Wesley Lumpkin couldn't make a tackle on third down and despite how well he had been playing this one hurt a lot. So even though Bobby Babcock finally made a play rolling out and finding sophomore and former five-star recruit Justin Carter for the long touchdown we weren't able to recover the onside kick which ruined our undefeated season and made the ACC race much much closer. Now if I wanted to get this team to the college football play playoffs, we could not lose again, and that was proving to be quite the challenge. However, Wesley Lumpkin continued to force turnovers to keep us in it, so even though my offense took forever to score, by the end of the first half, we were in a great position because the Tar Heels had zero points. In the third quarter, they finally got on the board, but it was too late for a comeback as we just drained the rest of the clock and left Chapel Hill with a win. This was the best possible start we could have had against Wake Forest as Wesley Lumpkin read the Demon Deacons quarterback like a book and took it all the way back to the house to give us an early lead. He was having an amazing defensive season and the momentum he got us at the beginning of the game would carry us to a win, but we needed some serious help. Syracuse could win the ACC if they won out, so even if we won our last conference matchup, we didn't control our destiny, which was really concerning to me. Anyway, NC State put up a good fight, but after they settled for three here, it was a tie game and that would be it for them because all we had to do was run out the clock and let senior Isaac Cook seal it for us. But the real question was, could the Seminoles beat Syracuse? And unfortunately, the answer to that would be no, so we had to pray the orange loss next week. But first, I was coaching in my biggest game yet to end the regular season. The number six team in the country, Georgia, traveled to Louisville to play us, and even if we missed out on the ACC championship, winning this game could catapult us into the college football playoffs, so I was thrilled that we scored first on the Bulldogs. To end the quarter, sophomore Bobby Babcock threw an unlucky interception, but that backed Georgia up, which was so close to resulting in a safety, and even though we failed to block the punt, the turnovers would come. At this point, Wesley Lumpkin should be in the Heisman race with the number of turnovers he's forced this season, as we'd end up going up by 14, and even though Georgia would fight to stay in it, our defense was simply too strong, or so I thought. This missed tackle from Daniel Hamilton would give Georgia their first lead of the entire game and all of a sudden we needed a miracle from Bobby Babcock and this offense. With time winding down he sent up a prayer to the 6'4 sophomore Justin Carter and after he somehow came down with it I knew we had to go for the win and my aggressive play calling paid off. I could not believe my offense did that but after Syracuse beat Boston College our ACC championship hopes were destroyed. However the college football playoffs were still possible and we could potentially sneak in. Mike Samuel carried the offense 
offense this year, but in the end, it wasn't enough for a spot. So since we got snubbed from the college football playoffs, we had to play in the Rose Bowl against Navy, who somehow went 11-2 and and was ranked 6th in the country. I couldn't believe this was how my fourth season at Louisville was going to end after how well I had coached all year, but on the bright side, almost everybody was returning next season, which meant that we could realistically make a championship run if I played my cards right. Senior Wesley Lumpkin ended his collegiate career with another interception which was very fitting, and I brought the Rose Bowl trophy back to the bill where I was making a lot of progress as a coach.